Well, friends, we're going to wait just a minute or two. Uh, I see people are populating, and so we'll wait a minute or two. So friends, I think uh, we have uh, a good chunk of registrants who have joined and I think we'll begin because we want to begin on time and end on time. <clears throat> so let me take this opportunity to welcome all of you who've joined us so far uh, in this, the second uh, seminar in a special uh, three-part series, which as you know is titled Steeled in Adversity, uh, Jews and uh, the History of Health Crises in America. Uh, this is uh, a webinar series sponsored by, of course, the Jacob Rader Marcus Center of the American Jewish Archives. Uh, friends, over the years, the Marcus Center has sponsored a, an array of webinars for HUC JIR alumni, for our benefactors and devotees of American Jewish history in general. And we consider these uh, webinar offerings to be yet another way that we can fulfill the mandate we inherited from the AJA's founder and namesake, Jacob Rader Marcus. And that challenge is to preserve and promulgate the history of the Jewish experience on the North American continent. So with the onset of this present pandemic, many HUC alumni and friends have been contacting us here at the AJA to ask if our American Jewish predecessors have ever experienced public health challenges similar to those that we are encountering. Did our forebears here in the new world face anything that is similar to the crushing circumstances that we have been experiencing in these early months of 2020. So this special three-part webinar series is an expression of the AJA's effort to address these questions and to provide information about our past. These learning sessions are reminding us that history does not repeat itself. Yet the past does echo forward in time. And we are perceiving those echoes during the course of these study sessions. And this afternoon, we are so honored to have a wonderful friend and colleague, an ardent supporter of the American Jewish Archives and one of the most distinguished American Jewish historians, Professor Pamela Nadell of American University as our teacher and before Dr. Nadell is formally and personally introduced by Rabbi Sally Prezand. Uh, and when we begin in a minute to delve into our topic for this second seminar, uh, let me first turn to some technical matters relating to the webinar itself for those of you who've joined us this afternoon. Now at any point during the course of the webinar, you will be able to type in questions that you might have into the chat box at the bottom of the screen. Now your questions will not be seen by all participants, but just by the panelists. And in light of the large number of attendees who are joining us this afternoon, 
uh, it is almost a certainty that we will not be able this afternoon to answer all of the questions that may come in. But we'll do our best to address at least a few questions towards the end of the seminar. And we, of course, invite you to uh, send in to the American Jewish Archives, to my address or to Dr. Nadell's address at uh, the American University, uh, any questions that you might have. We'll collect the questions as well and forward them on. Uh, and also, if it should be that you would like to teach this material that you're learning today in your own settings, uh, please don't hesitate to be in touch with us. We'd be delighted to help you as you plan to do that. Also, uh, on your screen, please note that you'll be able to see the panelists, but of course, and the documents and the photos and so forth, but only those people and not the participants. Now, at the conclusion of our webinar, there will be a few brief and important announcements, so please try to remain on for the entire hour. Please also note that 24 hours after the webinar concludes, you will be receiving a follow-up mailing, which will provide you with a URL or a link where, uh, from which you can download a full copy of the study packet that we're using today that you'll be seeing during the course of this webinar. It's been prepared for you by the American Jewish Archives, and you will get a copy of it uh, in 24 hours. And we hope, as I said, you'll want to use it and maybe teach from it. If you would like to find a recording of this webinar, uh, you should remember to uh, go to a certain website where you'll find an array of special learning uh, programs that have been sponsored by HUC. Don't forget to visit HUC's special learning portal, huc.edu backslash online learning. So now, uh, finally, it is really a genuine honor and truly a privilege for me to call upon Rabbi Sally J. Friesend, Rabbi Emerita of Monmouth Reform Temple in Tinton Falls, New Jersey. Uh, Rabbi Friesend certainly does not need any introduction from me, but I do want you to know that she is a really devoted friend of the American Jewish Archives and currently is serving as the vice chair of a special group of alumni, uh, which we call the B'nai Yaakov Council. The B'nai Yaakov Council is composed today of nearly 100 HUCJIR alumni who are all loyal supporters of the AJA. And it is no exaggeration to say, though I'm given to hyperbole, that the AJA's greatness and its unprecedented growth over the years since its founding in 1947 is due in such large part to the boundless support it has received from HUCJIR alumni. And the members of the B'nai Yaakov Council, uh, which uh, Sally leads, continue that important tradition of support and encouragement. So now I pass the baton on to my friend, my teacher, Rabbi Sally Prezend, who will introduce her student, Dr. Pam Nadell. Thank you, Gary. Uh, those on this webinar are well aware of your stellar leadership in uh, serving the American Jewish Archives. So suffice it to say that we are all very grateful for your passion, which is clearly reflected in all that you do, not the least of which is your vision in establishing the B'nai Yaakov Council, of which I am honored to serve as a vice chair. We all know that, that no one has played a greater role than you have in making certain that the legacy of Dr. Jacob Rader Marcus lives on and continues to inspire us all. As you mentioned, this webinar is the second in a series of three, focusing today on Jewish women and the health crises in US history. The fact that we are 
talking about uh, Jewish women reminded me of one of the myriad of books that Dr. Marcus wrote. And I have it right here since I'm sitting in my home library. Uh, the American Jewish Woman, A Documentary History. It was published in 1981, yet remains extraordinarily useful as a resource, introducing us to many women whose contributions to society might have otherwise gone unnoticed. Now, I was privileged to have studied with Dr. Marcus, and he followed my journey to the rabbinate very closely, as any accomplished historian would. And in 1972, just prior to my ordination, he published a press release from the archives. It's included in this book. And he began by talking about the number of women who had been at the college. And he uh, said that, all, that none of them had been ordained. Uh, and then he wrote, Sally is different. She means business rabbinical business. She is determined to be a rabbi, and by the grace of God and the faculty, she will be ordained. It is sad to think that American Jewry has had to wait so long for a woman to be ordained a rabbi. Galileo was right. The earth does move, but sometimes it moves very, very slowly. So Professor Pamela Nadell, today's speaker, carries on Dr. Marcus's legacy as one of today's foremost experts on the role of Jewish women in American society. She holds the Patrick Clendon Chair in Women's and Gender Studies and Gender History at American University, where she directs the Jewish Studies Program and received the university's highest award, Scholar Teacher of the Year. Her books include Women Who Would Be Rabbis, a History of Women's Ordination, 1889 to 1985, which is my personal favorite, and her most recent book, America's Jewish Women, A History from Colonial Times to Today, published last year by W.W. W. Norton, won the 2019 National Jewish Book Award as the Everett Family Foundation Jewish Book of the Year. Its paperback edition was published today, for which we offer our heartfelt congratulations. Now, I'm particularly honored to introduce Pam today because our friendship goes back a long time. In fact, when I was serving at Stephen Wise Free Synagogue, my first position after ordination, Pam was teaching in our religious school. Since then, our paths have crossed many times, for which I am very grateful. And I know that her presentation today will enrich us all. Thank you for being with us, Pam. I'm turning it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Zola. Thank you, Rabbi Prezand. I'm, I'm just so excited to be here. Um, I too had the privilege of meeting Dr. Marcus when I was a fellow at the American Jewish Archives and he had me to his house, gave me a stack of books and sent me back to the dorm <laughs> to read them. So it, it's really a very, it's a great honor to be here today um, and to be in this conversation. And um, what, what is I, I really appropriate for us is that 
tomorrow is uh, U.S. National Nurses Day. I don't know how many of you know that um, we have an annual National Recognition Day for nurses. It was established by President Reagan. And it marks the start of nurses, a National Recognition for Nurses Week, which ends on May 12th, with, um, which is the anniversary of the birth date of Florence Nightingale, who of course is a pivotal figure in international nursing. So it seems really appropriate to be talking about nurses today um, in this conversation about Jewish women and health crises in American history in the past. Um, we have over 3 million nurses in the workforce today. Um, they make up the highest percentage of um, any segment of the U.S. healthcare workforce. And of course, in this moment of adversity, um, we rely on them more than we ever have before. But I want to, before I get into the document that we're going to talk about today, I want to give you some, some background. I want to talk a little bit about nursing. I want to talk um, very much about the woman who, who authored the document that we're going to read in a little bit. And, um, and then we're going to turn to that document. So I'll kind of walk you, walk you through it. Um, of course, for millennia, women have nursed their families. Um, some of you may have heard of Rebecca Gratz from Philadelphia. Um, she was widely known as the founder of the first Hebrew Sunday School. She founded the first Jewish women's organization outside of a synagogue. She founded the first Jewish orphanage. But what you may not know is that after her father had a stroke, she helped her mother care for her father. And she also helped her three married sisters through 27 childbirths. So women's nursing roles in the home was something that was just taken for granted and something that was expected. Um, but it took the US publication of Florence Nightingale's Notes on Nursing in 1860 to make nursing a respectable occupation outside of the home. During the Civil War, the Confederacy discovered that men who had been wounded, who were nursed by women, actually had better outcomes. And so they created a position of matron inside their hospitals. And a Jewish woman, Phoebe Yates Levy Pember, was a matron at Chimborazo Hospital in Richmond, which was one of the largest Confederacy hospitals. And she left us a memoir of her experiences as a nurse. And it was very unusual for someone of her social class, of course, of her religious background, to enter into nursing. But before, um, before she did that, she was a widow and she was really unhappy living at home. So she signed up to become a matron in this hospital. You can actually see how there was a commemorative postage stamp issued in her name in the 90s. And she, um, at, at this hospital, she described what she did. So one of the things she did was she killed chickens to make chicken soup for the men. She guarded the food against wanton pilfering. She was in charge of the whiskey barrel. And this was really kind of, she writes about it as a war over the whiskey barrels because it was the matrons who kept the keys to the whiskey barrels, which was essentially the, the Civil War's chief anesthetic. Um, she would write home letters for illiterate soldiers. She read the Bible to them. She dressed wounds. She overcame her fear of the dead. And she also was very careful not to disclose the fact that she was Jewish. Until one evening, she was with um, a, a group of, of and people and a woman in there turned to her and asked her if she would give her a Yankee skull to keep her trinkets in. And Pember turned to the crowd and um, jested that she was that she was really happy that she was not born into a religion that commanded that you should love your neighbor um, and love your enemies. And she even jested that they should all join her church. That was her term um, until the war ended, so that they wouldn't have to pretend that they loved their enemies. Other Jewish women followed in her footsteps. I'll talk about um, one of them at the end of the hour from World War II, but I think it's really important to understand that nursing was never a profession that attracted large numbers of Jewish women. Um, and I think there are a number of reasons for that. First of all, it was very much wrapped up with Christianity, um, the sense that, uh, that 
nurses were there to care for the body and the soul. And of course, Jewish mothers were not keen on raising their daughters to change bedpans of strangers. They were much more interested in telling their daughters to go to school and become a teacher. But those who did choose nursing left us a powerful legacy of pride in their profession and their work. So it was never expected that Lillian Wald would become a nurse. Lillian Wald, we can see her, her portrait from the National Portrait Gallery and a portrait from later on. We're actually gonna see in our document a portrait of when she first became a nurse. Lillian Wald um, grew up as the daughter of privileged Jews. She was born in Cincinnati. This is not what Cincinnati looks like to those of you, what looks like to those of you who are on the call when you went to school there. But you can see it's the Queen City. And when she was, um, and here are her parents. Her parents were German Jewish immigrants who came to America after the 1848 revolution. And her father was a merchant. They were very comfortable. They were well off. And when she was, um, 11 years old, the Walds decided to move to Rochester. And we know that in Rochester, they did belong to the Reformed Synagogue, Brit Kodesh, but we also know that she had no formal Jewish education. And I think it's very important to understand Wald within the panorama of America's Jewish women, like the women um, who, whose voices were gathered in Dr. Marcus's terrific 1981 volume that I, I relied so much on when I was doing my own work. Um, in 1918, she specifically rejected inclusion in a book that was planned, it was never published, it was called Jewish Women in America. And she wrote in the letter to the author, she said that she didn't want to be part of that, because the title suggested work done by women as Jews. And she never really saw herself in, in that world. She saw herself much more as a universalist, as part of the late 19th century, early 20th century social gospel movement. She was educated at a French and English boarding school. She was destined for a life of home and society, but she was among a cohort of women who, even in these early days in the late 19th century, yearned for some kind of serious work. And she ended up in her life carving out a powerful career for herself um, as part of this cohort of progressive era Americans, but she was nestled within a cohort of progressive era American women. And we know that they preferred to live together, to work together, to vacation together. And her letters show that um, with these various progressive era women, they show their esteem, their affection. They also demonstrate eroticism. So she's very, very atypical for what we tend to think of when we think of women in, uh, Jewish women especially, in this era. So in the 1890s, after attending the birth of her sister Julia's child, where she was very impressed with the work of the visiting nurse who, who um, came by. By the way, Julia um, Wald married in a cathedral, raised her children as Catholic, so a different path for Jewish women in that era. She decided, Lillian Wall decided that she was going to become a nurse. And in 1889, she entered this nursing school, New York City Hospital. Um, and two years later, she graduated and she took a, a first position working as a nurse in an orphanage where she would have been the nurse on call for all of the children in the or orphanage. But Wald was not comfortable in that like being under the thumb of the master of the orphanage. And she has an experience in 1893 that she describes as her baptism of fire. Not my phrase, hers. Um, she was teaching a class in home nursing to immigrant women on the Lower East Side. And a little girl approached her and asked her to come and visit her sick mother. And then the child led her across the tenements. And as Wald later wrote in her first book, House on Henry Street, she wrote, and I'll quote, over broken roadways between tall reeking houses, across a court where open and unscreened closets were promiscuously used by men and women, 
up into a rear tenement by slimy steps and finally into the sick room. And she found there this little girl's mother hemorrhaging from having given birth two days before. And in that prompted Walt to decide that what she had to do with her life was to create an organic relationship. That was her word uh, from this era. It kind of actually sheds light on, if you remember studying Mordecai Kaplan, it set, sheds light on how that word was used. Um, she, the, she needed to have an organic relationship to the neighborhood in which this awakening had become. So on her 26th birthday, she founded a nurse's settlement. And here we see some of the nurses, um, how they're all dressed alike. And in this nurse's settlement, the nurses were on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In their first year, they saw 4,500 patients. And they didn't only come into the house to deal with the sick. They were, they were what we would think of much more, I think today also as kind of nurses and, and social workers, because they would intervene for children who'd gotten in trouble in school or with the police. If they came into a house where somebody didn't have a job, they would try to help that person find a job. And they, Lillian Wald's nursing settlement caught the attention of one of the most crucial American Jewish philanthropists of this era, Jacob Schiff. And in 1895, thanks to his generosity, they, bought, they acquired a house on Henry Street and created it first as a Henry Street nurses settlement, and then they launched it into a full-fledged um, settlement house. Now I need to say something about settlement houses so that you understand what this was. Maybe you've heard of Chicago's Hull House. Maybe you've heard of the Henry Street Settlement House. Um, but they were modeled on um, what was known as the British Tonby Hall, where um, a few years before the eight, it's like early 1880s, um, a number of middle-class educators and um, college students and clergy founded a house in a, in a London slum where they would live among the residents and they would provide services that those residents needed that in these days the governments were not providing and that hopefully they would uplift them out of poverty. So in time, the Henry Street settlement encompassed a full-fledged settlement house. It not only had its nurses, it had um, vocational training, it had clubs for children, it had drama, it, ha um, it had built the first playground in the Lower East Side of New York, it was in the back of the settlement house, um, it had a library, it even had a bank. And the Henry Street Settlement House um, eventually expanded, it built the neighborhood playhouse so that it, for theater productions. It built Clinton Hall, which um, as Wald wrote, the only place people used to have, working class people could cl gather was the saloon. And this was a place where tens of thousands of working class, class people would be able to gather. The Henry Street Settlement opened branches around New York, elsewhere in Manhattan, in the Bronx, and they were serving Italian and Hungarian and African American people. And this is going to be important because it's this element of the work that Wald had done and established before the Spanish flu breaks out that catapults her to a position of leadership in New York during that catastrophe. Um, Wald coined the term public health nurse. Oh, here you can see the Henry Street settlement or some of the children outside of it. Um, and she coined, she coined the term public health nurse because here we get a sense of what those nurses were doing. They, they would clamor over the roofs, roofs of the Lower East Side to get from um, house to house, not to have to go you know, upstairs, down, climb six flights, go down, climb another six flights. Um, Walt also wanted to remedy urban and national problems. That's why I said she was part of this progressive era cohort. And um, she joined activists who campaigned for better housing, for parks, for government mandated safety and sanitation in the workplace, for special safeguards for women and children. Um, the founding meeting of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, 
took place at the Henry Street Settlement. She was also a pacifist. She was a suffragist. Um, she was president of the American Union against militarism. So she had many, many roles, many hats that she wore before the Spanish flu broke out. So in 1918, when the flu broke out, America was at war. Um, the, the first thing that I want to say about America being at war when the flu broke out is that because Americans were at war, tens of thousands of doctors and nurses had been commissioned and sent overseas. So the first thing that I want you to understand is that we were actually dealing with a national shortage of medical professionals. Secondly, the, war, the Spanish flu ran for, and this won't, won't bring a lot of comfort to us in this moment, it ran for over a year. It had three waves. It started in the late spring of 1918. And it cropped up actually at a military um, training facility in Kansas. And then it seemed to subside, but then it came back. And when it came back in the early fall of 1918, it hit the East Coast first. There's a suspicion that it was actually carried by returning wounded soldiers who came back. And then it, and then it kind of, it, it, it worked its way along the East Coast and then it moved across the country and it didn't subside until the summer of 1919. Um, this flu was especially deadly. It claimed the lives of, in, in one month, of 195,000 Americans. Um, the estimates are that it, it, it claimed millions of lives around the, around the world, um, more than 50 million people, 650,000 in the United States in total. Um, scholars claim that the people, the number that died in the 1918 Spanish flu exceeded the number of deaths in the First and Second World War, the Korean War, and um, World War II, the number of U.S. deaths in those, in, in those wars. And the breadth of this pandemic, it exposed extraordinary weaknesses in the American health care system, in, in public health. And I think that's also something that we can take a lesson from today. So Wald wrote about the experience of marshalling the entire nursing corps of New York City and as many volunteers as they can put on the front in, um, in the document that we're going to turn to now. So I'm going to stop sharing the slides and I'm going to ask Dr. Zola to put up the document, which you are going also to receive um, in a link in uh, tomorrow, sometime tomorrow. So, um, and I'm gonna ask Dr. Sola to slide down to this public health nurse quarterly and this photo of Lillian Wald, we'll stop here for a minute. Let me tell you about, public, about, about the document, about where it appears. The public health nurse quarterly was um, a magazine that was, or a journal that was published by the National Organization for Public Health Nursing. No surprise, Wald founded it. In 1913, she was its founding president. And it, when, when, when she created this notion of visiting nurses, called public health nurses, visiting nurses, and different, has other names as well. When she created this, this concept coming out of the Henry Street Settlement and the Nurses Settlement, um, she wanted to set standards for the profession. So that was the purpose of this organization. And in, um, in 1918, she published an article based on her experiences at, at the head of what becomes the Nurses Emergency Council of New York City. So Dr. Zola, if we could go to the first page. Thank you. And I've, what I've done is I've highlighted for you some passages that I'm going to talk about so that we can read them and think about them together. So, let, let's let, let's find out what's happening on the ground in October 1918. Um, this this was published, I think, in November. So on October 10th at four o'clock in the afternoon, 
the Atlantic Division of the Red Cross called together the nurses of New York to mobilize for nursing power um, to deal with the problems that they were confronting. If you go down a little bit further in the paragraph, you will see that during the first four days of October, calls had come in from 467 diagnosed cases of pneumonia and influenza. And that was on top of all the, those that were not diagnosed because no doctor had seen them. And what's more alarming to Wald is the last sentence of this highlight. The nurses on staff were wearing masks and already 31 out of that day's staff of 170 had succumbed to the virus. So Wald was invited to become chairman of the Nurses Emergency Council. In her memoir, Not House on Henry Street, which was published in 1915, but a subsequent memoir, Windows on Henry Street, she sheds light and actually repeats a lot of what we're going to see here. She sheds light on some of the details of what happened. So what she tells us is she was approached to become the head of the um, emergency council and she agreed, but only if all of the organizations that had anything to do with nursing in the city, the municipal, the Christian, the Jewish organizations that had any nurses under their sway, if they would all come under the uh, organization of the Nurses Emergency Council. And you can see, I didn't highlight it, but if you scroll down and you look on page seven, you can see here that it's the Department of Health, the Salvation Army, Teachers College, I'm gonna come back to that, the American Red Cross. Dr. Zola, next page, please. Um, and then this continuing list of, of organizations that all agreed that they would come under the auspices of the emergency council. So the first thing Zoll did was she set up headquarters in the Red Cross building um, on, that was on Fifth Avenue then. I don't know exactly where in Fifth Avenue. I didn't have time to find it out, but if anybody knows, I'd like to know. And then she persuaded a, um, a, a Henry Street printer to stay up all night printing what we see as the document at the bottom of 306, a stern task for stern women. And not only what, so we see the version that appeared in advertisements paid for by the Red Cross and papers around New York City, but what she also did was this printer print, printed up handbills. They got a stack of them to the women she describes as women of means and comfort. And these women, she tells us this literally in her autobiography, they stood outside B. Altman's and Tiffany's on Fifth Avenue and handed out the bills, calling for people to come and volunteer to help. And if you go down to the third paragraph, you'll see it's, she wants housewives, dietitians, nurses' aides, the practical nurse, the undergraduate nurse, the trained nurse herself. Everyone was needed. And Wall tells us that by noon of the next day, of the day that they were handing these out, that hundreds of people had come to the Red Cross headquarters. If we could go to the next page, please. Um, so we, we see here in the second section of the highlight, the people who showed up, businessmen, bankers, members of the Salvation Army, um, college girls, society women, and they assisted with everything, dishwashing and nurses' aides, women of every class of society. What she doesn't tell us here, but what she told us in her memoir, is that one of her um, most um, uh, highly respected workers, Lillian Wald thought was likely a prostitute. So it was definitely women of every class of society. Um, so she writes about their, their, vol their volunteering and their being sent into the hospitals. And I want to step aside from the document for a second to talk about a story that you might've seen if, you, if you've been following some of the stories about the Spanish flu era. In, um, in the forward recently because it was so touching and, it, and Wald doesn't tell us this. Um, there was a story recently about a young woman named Alice Wolowitz whose brothers were off fighting World War I and she wanted to help. So she dropped out of high school. She went into 
uh, Philadelphia. She was from a smaller town in Pennsylvania. She wanted to nurse the wounded who were being sent home. And on October 18th, 1918, she went into the hospital, she became sick, and by that night she had died. Because the Spanish flu, unlike the pandemic of today, the Spanish flu seemed to particularly target young people, late teens, up uh, those in their 20s and 30s. And what we don't know from Walt's report is we don't know how many of those volunteers died. So we begin to read in this report of the effectiveness of the council um, the, and how they could help the hospitals who were overwhelmed, as we know in so many of our centers of this pandemic have been overwhelmed. And so if we go to the top of the next page, we'll see at the top of page nine, was, I didn't highlight this, but we'll see um, in the very first sentence, you can see an instructor and students from Teachers College took charge of the laundry because a hospital had called, we know from Walt's well, memoir, it was Bellevue. Bellevue Hospital said, that its workers were so frightened that they had walked off the job of the laundry and they had walked out of the kitchen. And so the um, Teachers College of Columbia, which in those days taught um, students what we what's called domestic science, um, in other words, how to care for the home and the family properly. Um, later on, it would be called home economics. Um, the teachers, the instructor and students from Teachers College went down to Bellevue took charge of the laundry, helped feed everyone. And then in this paragraph, and I won't stress it too much because I, I, I do need to move on, but you will be able to see here the different things that they did. They organized motor services so they could ferry doctors and patients around the city. They organized diets and distribution of food, linens and clothing, um, at the daily census of the patients. And if we if we move to the end of this document, we will see Wald's lessons from the document. So we'll go to the end of the nurses council, the last highlight. It's probably page 13. There we are. Thank you. The, the Nurses Emergency Council in New York City disbanded on November 6. It disbanded because the flu had begun to move on elsewhere. But Wald wrote that after a period of readjustment, the nurses and their colleagues in public health work must come together and out of the fires of war and epidemic experiences, fashion tools to educate better the people in the homes, use to the greater advantages of society, the latent values that lie within the courage and goodwill among men and women. Those who did so well during the epidemic could have done more, had they had the education for community service. And I think those are very powerful words for us today. When this time passes, what we'll be able to do for the next time the, a pandemic hits America, even if it takes another 100 years. So I'd like to turn now in my last two minutes to the very beginning of this document, just to tell you briefly to jump from World War I to World War II. Francis Slanger, was a nurse um, who was on the front lines, but not in the United States, but in Europe. She was born in Poland. She returned to Europe in June of 1944, waiting ashore just days after the GIs had made their landing. And she discovered 17 trucks filled with injured needing care. And if, and if we go down to the document, you will see um, a, 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 a letter that she was writing, an editorial that she was writing for the army newspaper, Stars and Stripes. And in it, she says, the GIs say we girls rough it, but we can't complain, nor do we feel the bouquets are due us. But you, the men behind the guns, the men driving our tanks, flying our planes, sailing our ships, building our bridges. It is to you we doff our helmets. Shortly after she scribbled these words, an enemy shell killed Francis Slanger. So nursing, it was a dangerous profession, both for those who went into the hospitals during a pandemic and those 
who waged war. Dr. Zola, over to you. Well, thank you so very much, Dr. Nadell. Uh, it is uh, so fascinating uh, and, and really reflective of, of all the work you've done over the course of your career to teach us uh, in particular today about our forebears, the women who made such remarkable contributions. And uh, uh, thanks to, for example, the writing of someone like Lillian Wald, we have a, a great deal of information that thank goodness has been preserved. But as you know better than uh, many, uh, very often we have heroic action on the part of our women forebears who uh, 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 there's very little left or not too much of a trace of documentary evidence. So um, I wanna skip down now to someone who in a sense embodies this and to talk very briefly about this woman uh, as a third uh, example today. And this is a picture of a woman. Uh, and those of you, if you're on the call from uh, Colorado and you've been to the Capitol building in Denver and you look up uh, around the Presidium, and you uh, look at uh, a series of beautiful stained glass windows. One of those windows is the window that you're looking at, which is the window uh, that features uh, Francis Weisbart Jacobs. Uh, who was this woman in Colorado, and how was it that she ends up with uh, her beautiful stained glass uh, uh, tribute in the, the Capitol building of uh, Colorado? Uh, well, this woman is known as the mother of charities in Colorado. And what do we know about her? Well, in, in the same way uh, uh, that uh, Lillian Wald was a Cincinnatian, uh, Frances Jacobs, uh, though born in Kentucky, her family moved to Cincinnati where she was raised and uh, definitely inspired by the very large and active Jewish community here in Cincinnati. She marries uh, a school sweetheart here in Cincinnati, and eventually they will move because of business to the burgeoning community out west in the 1860s, that is a uh, community not too far from uh, Denver. And all I'll say about her in the very little time you'll, you'll see ma the materials we provided uh, is that Frances Jacobs was smitten when she arrives in, uh, in Colorado, probably always had a, what, what uh, we were just talking about in, in terms of uh, a Wald and Slanger, this uh, innate drive to be helpful to humankind, to do good things for other people. It's possible that part of this initiative comes from the fact that she had not only a family, but she lost one of her children in childbirth, uh, uh, the youngest, who, who uh, and she suffers the pain of that loss. Whatever it was, it's translated into a severely, a, a, a sincere commitment to the helping professions. And she becomes, if you will, um, devoted to all sorts of charitable work. Just in the course of the 15 years of her short life before she perishes, she is one of the founders of the Hebrew Ladies Benevolent Society in Colorado, in Denver. She is uh, not just uh, active in the Jewish community, she's active in the general community. She's one of the founders of the Denver Ladies Relief Society. Then she gets herself involved in the Free Kindergarten Association. She's so concerned about young children who are not getting a proper education. Then she organizes a, uh, a national organization, the Charity Organization Society. And even towards the end of her career, she becomes involved in the establishment of what's called in Denver, the Community Chest. And this will uh, develop into what we call today, the United Way. This is a woman who, for about 18 years is 
goes from one service area to another, a true social worker. But towards the end of her career, uh, friends, she gets involved in something that in a sense might actually have caused her death. And that is the terrible epidemic of tuberculosis. Now, most of us, like so many things, like cholera, like uh, the yellow fever, these things have been eradicated and so we forget about them. But here is a quote from the man who first kind of identified uh, what it was that caused tuberculosis in 1882. And if you read this quote, you see that at the end of the 19th century, more people died of tuberculosis than any of the other plagues. And what this man, uh, Bavarian doctor Robert Koch discovers is that in fact, the uh, disease comes from a kind of virus and therefore it can be given from one human being to another. And so the idea of pushing people off into sanitariums arises, sanatoriums as arises as a solution to TB or pulmonary consumption. And here you have a, uh, uh, in front of you a picture of a poster which uh, encourages the idea of breathing fresh air, and uh, in behind it is a picture of one of the sanatoriums in, uh, in uh, Colorado, in Denver, uh, one of the Jewish uh, sanatoriums that uh, uh, would offer care and loving kindness to people who suffered from this terrible disease. Now, uh, w according to the, uh, the information that we have, this woman began uh, in her late 30s and 40s to tend to people who had tuberculosis. She visited them, she went to their houses, she took care of them, and she becomes very committed to the idea of creating a, a hospital that will care for them in, in the, uh, towards the end of her life. And she dies of what apparently was pneumonia. Who knows? It's possible that she herself uh, 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 was, a, was, was afflicted with the disease because she went into the houses uh, uh, very selfishly, selfishly, selfishly. And uh, in, no, on November the 3rd, 1892, she passes away at the young age of 49. And we have at the American Jewish Archives, we have a copy of her memorial booklet that was compiled during her uh, funeral service. And in there are really, it's the only information we have in a sense of firsthand information of what kind of woman this woman Frances Jacobs was. And I just wanted to show you just a few selections from some of the speakers that give us a feel of her personality. And then with that, I'll end. Uh, this, one of the uh, themes that comes across is a, a, a very detailed description of her good nature and her sense of humor. Uh, this uh, Unitarian minister who was invited to speak at her and deliver a eulogy at her funeral uh, is the son of the famous uh, president of uh, Harvard University, uh, Eliot. And if you just begin to look at this document, this is a, a paragraph from his eulogy. He says, Mrs. Jacobs had a wonderful gift in her power to deal with repulsive people. She did that hard thing without any of the philanthropic cast that bids us to love the unlovely. She did not lead us into the filthy alleys and the bold and, uh, and bid us admire the fragrance of the air and the beauty of the scenery. She knew when things were hideous and hateful, but she tried to transform them into things that were lovely and lovable. She, uh, in a sense, she is trying to make uh, 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 the difficult circumstances uh, acceptable to the people who are trying to help them, to instill within them a love for what they're doing. 
if you look down at the last line of this paragraph, she says, humor, uh, humor is often a vent for grief, and without it, the heart may break under the load of care and responsibility. Mrs. Jacobs' power to laugh did make her work easier for herself and her friends, but it did not imply an absence of self-denial or seriousness of purpose on her part. And then uh, the rabbi, Rabbi Friedman, a graduate of the Hebrew Union College, he also talks about her humor and how she possessed a rare and genial humor. She saw the bright side, the sunny side of everything. Thousand and one happy anecdotes tripped from her lips. And finally, uh, again, a theme that comes through, which I think is something we don't often hear about, but is worth remembering. Francis Jacobs apparently was an unbelievable fundraiser for these causes, and that her ability to speak and to be persuasive uh, was one of her gifts. And in this paragraph, I won't read it all, she apparently, in a meeting that took place just two years before her death, she apparently is uh, a little distressed, you see in the first paragraph, because she had come upon some apparel that belonged to her little deceased son in her house, and it set her into sort of an upset, she was sort of upset as she came to this meeting to speak and to help with this particular philanthropic uh, cause. And then if you go into the second paragraph, you see that even at the late hour of 11 o'clock at night, when she finally gets to the front of the room and the podium, she delivers on the basis of bringing up her own loss, she de uh, delivers a talk trying to encourage philanthropic donors to do something for the betterment of humankind. And if you look in the middle of that paragraph, she says, a moment made everyone realize what true sympathy meant. Never was an audience so deeply moved, so visibly affected, and Mr. McCulloch referred to that eventful appeal as divine. For notwithstanding his own eloquent and forceful address, it was the power of Mrs. Jacobs that stirred the multitude as they had never been before. Well, she lived long enough to see at least the founding brick put down on a hospital, which at her death was named after her. But of course, because of the monetary crisis, the silver crisis of 1893, it took many years before this hospital was finally erected. This hospital is the basis, friends, of the National Jewish Hospital in Denver, which has spent uh, almost a century and more uh, working on uh, all sorts of respiratory issues. Uh, this woman, who maybe many of you have never heard her name, as you may not have heard Francis Slanger's name. I know everybody, most everybody knows about Lillian Wald. These are great participants in the crises of their times who were devoted to the betterment of, uh, of their own community. And I believe what we've learned today is a lesson for our own day and age. They should be inspirations to us as we go forward in our own day and our own age. Uh, it, you might enjoy reading this little quote that is one of the few quotes that we actually have from Ms. Jacobs. She says, in philanthropy and reform, we in Denver have made a good beginning. We've, we have genuine impulses and our faces are set in the right direction. Aided by your counsel and example, we shall yet to nobler work in caring for the unfortunate and in redeeming humanity through the power of a mighty faith and a mighty love. Well, friends, uh, uh, if there are any questions, I'm gonna ask Lisa Frankel to see in the last minute or two if we have a question. Anything, Lisa?
We have a few questions and a few comments. So mm -hmm. one of the questions is, do you think volunteers did more in 1918 than they are doing in today's pandemic? Or do we need more volunteer efforts today or are paid workers doing what volunteers did in 1918? You want me to take this? I, I think, I think um, the, the reason I stressed the shortage of healthcare personnel was because of the uh, of of the way they were marshaling volunteers in 1918 was because of that because of the shortage of healthcare personnel and um, today I don't I, I don't have the sense that hospitals are taking volunteers because they don't want them to get sick so and they don't and the larger issue is of course they don't have enough medical equipment for them they don't have masks um, for example and and face shields. So I think people are volunteering today in different ways. Um, they're, certain, they're helping their neighbors, they're shopping for the elderly, they are doing all they can to cheer up those who are confined to very small spaces. They're trying to figure out what to do. You know, everybody's on Zoom for something like we are now, um, but there's volunteering that's happening now, but it's not in the, in the physical spaces of the hospitals. Great. One of the comments that was made was, um, as you may know, the person who is head of the state of Ohio public health is a Jewish woman, Dr. Amy Acton. Mm -hmm. And uh, John Covey says the tradition goes on. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Well, friends, what you see in front of you, at our time is, is up. And if you see, we have provided in the package, you'll be receiving some bibliography so that you if you want to learn more, here you have it. And of course, I'm going to promote Dr. Nadell's award-winning book, which you can see here, and, uh, and it's listed number one on the bibliography because all of these women that we discussed today, all three are mentioned and described in her book as well. And uh, let me just now conclude very briefly uh, by uh, uh, saying uh, a thank you, of course, uh, to uh, Dr. Nadell for uh, an excellent, excellent, wonderful seminar on uh, these women that we heard about and learned about today. And to, of course, to uh, Rabbi Prezan for being with us and introducing Dr. Nadell. Uh, Want to remind you, everybody who is still online, that uh, recordings of this webinar and special programs will be found on HUCJIRs special learning portal, again, that's huc.edu backslash online learning. So keep an eye out for more AJA and HUC learning opportunities. Finally, don't miss next Tuesday, the 12th, the last in our series, uh, same uh, time on Tuesday, the 12th, same station, when uh, Rabbi Dr. Lance Sussman and Rabbi Bailey Romano uh, will be teaching us about Jewish leadership in health crises in America. So again, thanks to Dr. Nadell, uh, Rabbi Presen, and of course, friends, let me express my thanks to the amazing staff and administration of the American Jewish Archives, and of course, the redoubtable Lisa Frankel, who for 36 years has been my partner in crime here at HUC in Cincinnati, her capable contributions to the AJA and to our school uh, defy enumeration. So thank you, Dr. Nadell. Thank you, Rabbi Prezen. Thanks to all of you who have made time this afternoon with Zubin fatigue to be with us. Shalom, goodbye, and we look forward to seeing you next week, May the 12th at four o'clock on our final webinar series. Thank you and bye-bye. Bye everybody, thanks.